Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. It's been really really long since I uploaded any video and there are quite some good reasons for it. So in this video I'm going to do a bit of recap what I have been doing for the past couple of months. But thanks to all of you guys for keeping the channel alive. It's not dead, the channel is still growing. People, new people are coming, new people are watching the content that I already uploaded. So what's been happening with me? As most of you would know, I am in my final year of my PhD. This is my third year. I just finished my third year and, uh, and I have to submit my thesis, PhD thesis very soon, like in a couple of months. So right now I'm busy writing up my thesis. So now my work contract, so I have an employment contract uh, in Germany with a research institution and I'm enrolled as a PhD student in the University of Regensburg. Now there are a couple of sources how you can fund your PhD. Either you get some fellowship from a grant that your supervisor or your professor has in his lab and you're getting paid from that. So the salary would be pretty much on the same scale. So the salary scale that you would get is TVOD 13 or E13. And then, then further there are uh, levels in it, but uh, don't worry about it too much. So basically, I when I came to Germany uh, in back in 2020, um, the source of funding was I got employed as a research associate in a research institution. But the research institution cannot award award PhD degree. Only a university can award you a PhD degree. So my supervisor in the research institution has a dual position. So he is also the head of the institute and also has a professorship position in the university. So I am registered as a PhD student in his department in the university but I am employed by the research institution in his department. So I hope you can now figure, understand or get a picture how this thing works. And it's not very like rare situation. It's very common. So there are also students, my, my colleagues who are employed or who are working in the university and also getting paid by the university fellowship. But in my case, I am enrolled as a student in the university, but I get paid or my fellowship or the salary, whatever you call it, it comes from the research, research institution. Now this is, research institution is a bit different than what is uh, university. So on a very simple scale, if you understand university to be the core academia and something like uh, industry, so research institution in which I'm working is somewhere lying in between. It's neither a university, neither complete core industry. So by this, I get a good exposure of both how the things are in core academia and also how the things are in industry. So this is some benefit if you enroll or work in a research institution, you would get also good feel how the industry people work. Coming back to the topic, I was employed by the research institution and my contract uh, was for three years, which finished in the month of February in 2023. So since after 28th February, basically I'm unemployed now. So I had to work on that. So what to do after that and whether I want to go into academia, pursue academia or go into industry. So the, all these things I had to figure out. In the current situation, basically I, apply, I applied to the federal um, employment agency in the Germany for an um, unemployment benefit. When you get salary in Germany, uh, you also pay social contributions. Uh, this also includes unemployment tax, which you pay. So once you become unemployed in Germany for whatever reason, either your contract expired or whatever reason, and you have been paying your unemployment tax or social contributions for at least the past 12 months, you are actually eligible to get a monthly allowance by the German government uh, to live and uh, go through your expenses and so on. So I already applied for that in the month of March. Could I would make a separate video on that because I this is a, another complete topic, how to do this application, what are the documents, what is the process, how to handle the paperwork and everything. I would make a separate video on that. So this is the first thing that I have been doing 
most of my time has been actually invested in just working with on my phd topic uh finishing up my experiments and preparing the final report to submit uh to the doctoral committee so that i could have my defense and my phd will be finished i have also been applying to postdoc positions and um i got a confirmation 2 weeks ago that i got a postdoc position so they accepted my my application uh now again i had to give an interview i made a cover letter i made a my i refined my cv um all these things all the documentation work that i did during my phd application i did it again to get into the postdoc application and um, i would make a separate video on that so how did i make my 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 cover letter so it took me about 2 to 3 hours to make a, a cover letter now it's it did not take me a lot of time because i have done this so many times i would make a separate video on that so where i actually explain my with the example of my own cover letter which got actually selected um, how did i make it so you would understand how to best make a cover letter or a motivation letter i would be starting as a post doctoral uh, researcher or a post doctoral scientist um in a couple of months so most likely i will start my post doc position in july or august something like that so this was all that's been happening with my life in the past few months my phd is almost finished my work contract is finished so currently i am unemployed and which is no fun but you have to be prepared for any of these kind of situations it's a very general thing that happens so after your phd you might have some months gap uh, where you try to find some other positions i was also thinking of moving to industry maybe i will i am not actually sure what i would do whether i stay in academia in long time or i move to industry after my post doc but uh, one thing i that was pretty sure i was going to do that after my phd i would do at least one post doc just in case if i want to shift back move back to india in future so that i would have one post doc in my profile uh it makes it much easier to get into research positions if i want to pursue research further or stay in academia if i go back to india i would make uh videos on all of this step specifically how i got the post doc position how i prepared my documents how i prepared myself for the interview what what was the interview like my interview went pretty long like more than an hour or so and um, it was really competitive um but i got through um, and now i have a confirmed post doc position which i'll start in a couple of months okay so before i wrap up this video i'll be taking a couple of questions uh, from you guys so the first question that i get a lot is when to actually start the application now in my previous video i mentioned in one of my previous videos i mentioned that you have to start for master student so if you are a master student you are currently doing your masters and you are in your third semester so um i mentioned in the, my previous video that you should start by the end of third semester or when you uh, just start um uh, your fourth semester that is your last semester because the whole process of getting to the phd position takes about 9 to 10 months even if after you get selected it would take like at least 3 to 4 months since you go through this whole all visa process and then finally come here and join the question from you guys that i got a lot is that if you are starting your applications or you are starting this whole journey of going abroad for your phd or for the higher educations how can you start in your third or fourth semester because you don't have your masters final degree or you haven't given the final examination you don't have your 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 certificates so when i mean when i say that you start when you when you enter your fourth semester or by the end of your third semester it does not mean that straight out start sending applications when i mean that start the applications i mean start firstly preparing your documents these are your cover letter your motivation letter your cv uh, in order to make uh, these documents from which you will actually get some response it takes a lot of time especially when you are starting 
so for example this for me uh, during when i was doing this my applications for my phd it took me one to two months to finally get to a version of the application when i say application i mean simply your cover letter or your cv or your motivation letter i got to a final version when i started getting some good responses some positive responses until it was one to two months so it will take you some significant amount of time to actually understand how to write your research profile into a one or two page summary so the, your whole research profile even if you don't have a very strong profile how to present yourself so it's all about presenting it's all about selling yourself basically in in straightforward terms your supervisor or whoever professor is going to hire you is looking for value for him or her you are just an investment who is going to work in his lab for 3 to 4 years and going to produce some some research work which should be published or get some grant money from uh, your project so basically this is what you need to think about even if you don't have i have seen candidates cracking the or uh, getting the phd positions even with very weak profile the one thing and the most important thing that you need to focus on is relevant research experience even if you don't have publication but you have relevant research experience and you are actually able to write about it so a professor would simply know by reading your cover letter whether you have actually done some useful and interesting work or not they are so experienced and it's a very bad idea to copy paste someone else's uh, doc- uh, content right because they will understand if you just copy paste somewhere from internet or some other person's uh, research profile and for example even if you get through from the you, if you get called in the interview they will know by just talking to you in then 5 to 10 minutes if you are really if you really did that work or you are just exaggerating stuff so don't write stuff in your cv or cover letter which you actually did not do yourself okay and if you were like part of it you mention the big picture and you mention clearly that this is the part that i did i'll show my own cover letter that i was i prepared for my postdoc position which i got selected for um that would give you a pretty good idea how to actually make a successful cover letter which would get you selected you have to know this scientific language basically to successfully write a very good or high content uh, cover letter uh, you have to know how to reply to emails that's really really important and you have to be prompt in your responses okay uh, so another question revolving around this whole cover letter and motivation letter stuff a student recently asked me um, whether they can pay someone like an agency uh, to write their cover letter for them and they would pay uh, the agency so guys let me tell you this is a very very bad idea do not do this if you are not able to prepare a simple cover letter how are, how are you going to handle your phd work you have to write reports you have to prepare presentations this whole process of preparing your documents your cover letter and your motivation letter your cv these documents will give you the ability to understand how scientific writing works it's not really you're not writing a paper or something but still you should be able to give a summary write a summary one page summary of your research profile that's a very important thing to do if you are so do not think about doing uh, going to some agency and pay them and so that they can write you because if you can't do this stuff then forget uh, your phd from abroad and stuff because then it's not going to happen simply so the last question is also revolving around these consultancies or these agencies that help out students through this uh, whole process of uh, visa and um, this um, Uh, there are agencies which help out students to for the complete process like finding positions and then preparing documents and then until they get selected and with the travel and stuff so guys my strong suggestion my advice to you to new students who are trying to come to abroad is simply do not consult with these agencies do not outsource 
the work that you are supposed to do. Because trust me when I tell you, I have been living here for more than three years in Germany and the bureaucracy and the documentation work that you would need to do once you reach here is far more, far more intensive than what you have to do in order to get here. So if you are not able to handle that minor documentation, yes, I'm going to say minor because it is minor. Once you come here, you would see the amount of bureaucracy Germany has or any other European country has. You would start, I received, for example, I'll tell you, I received more than 50 letters from the German government regarding several things. Germany is not a highly digital country. It's the digitization in Germany, it's still uh, far behind. So you will get letters like actual paper letters when you come to Germany. If, you, if any government organization, if the university wants to contact you, they will send you letters, which is quite outdated if you ask me, but that's how it works. And they're all in German. So you would need to convert them into some your native language to understand them unless you understand German. Also, the administration here, it's you have to keep up with the administration. There are new rules, regulations coming up. Also, during this whole pandemic time, the regulations keep changing every time. So basically what I'm trying to say that you have to learn how to handle bureaucracy. That's part of your career. So when you move upward in, in your career, for example, I am now finishing with my PhD. I'm moving to a postdoc scientist position. My responsibilities will also increase. At some point in your scientific career or any career you are in, you would be expected to handle administrative work. So in order to handle those kind of works, you have to master these minor tasks uh, that will come your way when you start your application. So do not outsource these things. Do them yourself. That would be hugely beneficial for you. Till date, I have never consulted any of these agencies which offer these kind of services. I search on my own. I Maybe I ask for some suggestion to my seniors or some other uh, people in the same community for some advice, but I do my own research and then only I proceed with the work. That gives me also like a comfort that if even if I fail, that's my own responsibility. I cannot blame anyone else that, okay, you did not do well. That's why I failed. So this should not be the thing. Okay. So that's what I'm just trying to convey to you. Do not go to any of these consultancies. Do your own research. Everything is available on internet. So you do not, you, it's not like it's, it's some hidden information. It's on, it's on the web. Just do some research and you will find everything pretty much. Plus, I try to cover most of your doubts as much as possible. That's it for this video, guys. I'll wrap it up. Share this video with your friends. And thanks for keeping the channel alive. I'm back and I will be uploading more content for you guys i'll try to respond to your emails but try to ask concise questions that way i would be also able to help you help you out better i'll see you guys next time bye